Are we good? Good morning, Facebook Live. We have little things being passed out right now, but here's a plaque that says, Faith Moves Mountains, Matthew 17, 20. And this goes, I'm gonna put this over here, Faith Moves Mountains, got our little plaque over here. All right, we just had church. I gotta, I might have to move my flags here. Got some flags. The red represented the blood of Jesus and the gold was, or the gold was gold purified in fire. And speaking about purified in fire, we're sweating up here. It's hot. It's hot. Prophecy was flowing. See, that's church. You agree that's church? That's church. When you let the Holy Spirit move, he's powerful. All right. Oof. I'm trying to collect myself. I need a fan up here. It's hot, hot, hot. Title of today's message is The Mustard Seed. And the congregation just got handed these little tiny vials with a mustard seed, which I'm going to show you in a little bit on video. It's super tiny. Let me just make sure my sound is off here. All right, so Luke 18, 8. Jesus said, red words of Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Will he really find faith on the earth? Oof, not what you thought I was going to start with, is it? Nope. This scripture is part of a deeper story. There was an unjust judge who didn't fear God. Do we know anyone in the land who isn't fearing God? Multitudes. Multitudes are not fearing God and did not regard any man. There was a persistent widow who he was just going after and after this unfair and unjust judge. And he didn't want to avenge her, but he also didn't want her to keep coming back to him because he she troubled him, the Bible says. In the Amplified Version, it says that this widow troubled him. So basically, she was a pain in the neck to this unfair, unjust judge. And he didn't want her to weary him. Because you know when someone keeps coming after you, anyone who's a parent and has children and the toddlers go after you, mom, 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 and they're pulling on you, pulling on you. They weary you after a while. And you're like, you know what? And you give them the cookie before dinner because you just want to shut them up. <laughs> so basically, this unfair judge wanted to shut up the widow woman. But in verse 6, it says, the word says, and this is the word, this, the Bible is the word. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Will he find this kind of persistent faith on earth? That's what he's wondering. That's what Jesus was saying. And we see here that this widow woman was persistent and relentless in her faith. She was persistent and relentless. And the Lord wants us to be that way too. He wants us to be persistent. He wants us to be relentless with our faith. And that seems like, you know, some of us are tired. How many of you are tired of fighting? We've been battling for a long, long time. And if you're in battle for a long time, now I've never been in the military, but I would imagine you physically and emotionally and mentally become very drained yeah. and physically tired. And you become weary. And it's the same thing, you know, when they say people lost their battle or they're battling with cancer, that's no lie. Cancer is a battle. And what do we see when we see people with cancer? They get weary after a while. They get worn out because it's a battle. Well, this is what we have to do with our faith. We have to be persistent. And will he really find faith on earth? You know, I always wondered, what would it be like? What's going to be going on 
in the earth that Jesus would say this. When he returns, will he find faith? Why? I always, always like, why, Lord? What's it going to look like? Like right now. Like right now. Like right now. He's not talking to the unsaved people who don't know the Lord. Sin or sin, they don't know the Lord. Jesus is talking to the church. Will he find faith? <clears throat> so you got to know, why would he ask that? When the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith on this earth? Why? What's, how bad is it going to be? Have we lost our focus? Have we lost our direction? Do we even know what we're fighting for anymore? You know, during praise and worship, I think we were getting what the fire of the Lord was putting on us. We were humbling ourselves. We were repenting for the wickedness in this land. You know, it's not, like I said, you know, when people don't know the Lord, they don't know the Lord. My sister always taught sinners sin. It's what they do. They sin, they don't know any better. But when you see it in the body of Christ, will he find faith in this dark and ugly world? Will he find it? And you could sit there and you could feel that this is kind of discouraging a little bit because will he find faith? Well, here's the thing. If faith were easy, we wouldn't need to have it. So it's got to be something that we've got to work at. we got to put something forth because if it were easy and we didn't need it, we wouldn't have to have it. We have to have faith because things are going to happen. You don't need faith when everything is going smoothly and beautiful, do you? You're not crying out, Father. But when you're hitting rock bottom and you're hitting low spots and you're hitting depressed spots and you're hitting anxiety spots and you're hitting broke spots and you're hitting desperate spots, that's when you need the faith. So you don't need the faith when everything's going really well. Do you? No. Will he find faith? So take our society, for example. Would he find faith on earth if he were to return right now? If Jesus were to return right now, would he find faith or would he find a lack of faith? And I'm talking to the body of Christ. This is actually a body of Christ message today. Will he find faith? Now this widow woman kept going to the judge and demanding justice and legal protection from her adversary. She wanted legal protection from her adversary. Okay. So this judge wouldn't right away. And the Bible says for a time he wouldn't. But because this widow continued to bother him, he gave her justice and legal protection. The judge describes her as being an intolerable annoyance. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says to us, will not our just God defend and avenge his elect, his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night. Will he delay in providing justice on their behalf? Jesus says, Jesus. Can you say Jesus? Because I just want to make sure we're all worshiping the same person here. Jesus says, I tell you that he will defend and avenge them quickly. He might? No. He will defend and avenge them quickly. Now, here's where our message comes in. Now, can you guys take that in? I want you to take that in. Jesus himself said, God will defend and avenge. God will defend you and he will, he will avenge you. God 
was the first Avenger. For those who might be in I love the Avengers. I really do. But God was the first one. He'll avenge you. And you know what? And he'll defend you. You know, sometimes we wonder what's going on in this ugly world. But God. See, we forget who he is. I serve a very powerful God. I'm sorry. I'm like, this praise and worship was weepy. It was hot and fiery. It was emotional today. But God is emotional. You know, y'all that are coming are missing out on a party in here. I'm telling you, a morning party. Now, not only, well, so, although Jesus Yes, wants and expects our faith to be persistent. He wants to know when he comes back, is he going to find it? He also wants us to know his character. And he also wants to know the character of our God and his faithfulness. you got to know how faithful he is. Because how are you going to know and stand? You know when a little kid gets treated poorly or they don't like something? Do you know what they usually do? Especially if they have a close relationship with their dad. I'm telling my dad, I'm going to tell my dad, my dad's going to beat you up. <laughs> the little kid knows, I'm going to tell my father. My father isn't going to like this. You want to know something? You know what I have to say today? Our father, my father, doesn't like this. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like the business that's going on right now. It's ugly to him. And it's ungodly doesn't like it. So what is he going to do? And his kids are down here crying out, Father, do you see? He says, I see. But I will defend you and I will avenge you, says the Lord. Someone might say, what is she squawking about up there? Well, when you live in a state like New York State, and you're a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. And I'm going to say that again. A born-again, spirit-filled Christian. What's going on is not godly. It's not okay. It's not okay to the Father. It's not okay. I'm getting, I'm getting juicy out here. i got to wipe my nose. Juicy. Wipe my eyes. Why is that the word? I know. You heard me. I hate that, but I said it. But listen. He doesn't like what's going on. And I see people, I, again, you know, even people in the world know it's getting dark and ugly. They see it. Do you know people in New York City, and it's not just New York City, especially in New York City, but in all cities, people are afraid here. They're afraid here. Why? Because police forces have been defunded. You know, I was telling a story last night. We were at a family fire, a fall fire. It was fun. And I was sharing a story about our summer. And our summer was very disturbing on so many levels. Can't even, I don't even want to get into all the, you know, my congregation knows the disturbing stuff. It's just, it was just disturbing on a lot of ends. But we also were violated. Our home was violated. Not They didn't get into our home, but they tried, or whatever they were doing. They were trying to scare us at the very least. It's very hard in the middle of the night to have people banging on your house. And what was the effect? You know, when our family members were saying, it must have been so scary, so we're showing them the picture. And, um, and our family members were saying, it must have been scary. Did you call the police? Yes, we called the police. Well, how long did it take them to get there? I don't know, about five or six minutes. And a friend of ours said, well, that must have, but it probably felt a lot longer. Yeah, it felt a lot longer. And you start getting to the point where you're like, we got to protect ourselves. So in the state of New York, you want to protect yourself, but that right is, they're attempting to try to take that right away too. And American people, we have a beautiful country. But we cannot let the darkness and the evil invade our territory. Mm -hmm. We just can't. And so God will defend and he will avenge us. Now, 
I'm going to say something here. This is not political, and this isn't trying to get political, but, you know, Jesus was political. The political people of that time hated him. They hated him. They called him a cult. They, they, they called him a cult leader. And they, they hated him. They accused him of everything. Mm -hmm. They accused him of everything. Do you understand that in certain states in the United States of America, they're trying to shut mouths of pastors. Mm -hmm. They're trying to shut doors of churches. I, I understand some people are in the other parts of the country and they're like, what is she talking about? But you gotta be living it to know what's going on. And it's not okay. It's not okay. And if we, you know, if we sit there and we shut up and we don't say anything, they're gonna, they're gonna do what they wanna do. Years and years and years ago, I was told that born-again, spirit-filled Christians are considered a threat in our country. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. They consider us a terrorist threat. I'm concerned about that. I'm frightened that Christians are being called fascists. I'm frightened by that. I'm frightened that what is in the word is living out. That in the end times, they'll call good evil and they'll call evil good. Do, do you see it? Yeah. You know, I, I really believe, you know, the Lord puts little mandates on your heart of what he wants you to do and what your call is. And part of, part of my heart and my mandate, I believe, is to share with the body of Christ the love of the Father, because I get it. And I, you know, that's part of it. But part of it is to have a voice and to let you know that you have a voice. And to, and to like kind of dispel the lies. Does that make sense? To cut through the garbage and dispel the lies. The little ones are fine. They're not a distraction. They're precious. They're good. They're good. All right. So now God wants us to know his character and his faithfulness. And, and you know what, brethren? He wants us to know this thing. Amen. Because if we don't know what this says, we're going to be deceived. We're not going to get it. We're not going to know. And people can lie to us then. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We have to know this. It's so important. But here's some good news. In Luke 17, 6, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the seed. And it would obey you. That's one scripture. In Matthew 17, 20, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Do you hear that? Now, what I had my handsome husband, Lou, pass out for the congregation, they got a little vial, because Ann hopped on it and ordered it quickly. Little tiny vial. They each got one. I'm going to hold it up for the camera. Can you see it on there? Cool. Mm -hmm. And there's a tiny little, I'm trying to shake it a little. There's a little mustard seed in there. It's very tiny. So I want you all to look at that mustard seed. You get to keep these little vials, by the way. And every time you feel like you don't have faith enough, I want you to look. Oh, Colby's getting it on the YouTube one, too, as we upload to YouTube. This is all you need. Look at your vial. That's it. Do you think you could gather enough of this? And you need this size of faith. My thumb is in the way. You need this size of faith to move a mountain. Now, some people will say, these are just words. They're not words. I believe that actual mountains can move. I really do. I also believe that mountains in your life can move. Amen. What's your spiritual mountain? Is it your finances? Is it fear? Is it, you need a new car? 
You need a, a new house. What's your mountain? What's your mountain? And someone might say, well, you need more faith for that new house or that new car. No, you, no, you don't. You need this mustard seed size of faith. It's so tiny. It's so tiny. Why did Jesus use the mustard seed as the example? Why? Because he's letting you know, even though a mustard seed is tiny, it's tiny. That's all it takes. Amen. You only need that much, that tiny, tiny bit to move a mountain. Well, you know how I am, I like to do my research. So I started investigating the mustard seed. That's another whole message for another day. Because that little tiny mustard seed can turn into a 10 foot to a 30 foot tree. No wonder he used the mustard seed. Again, that's a message for another day. It turns into something great, doesn't it? So, I'm going to continue on. doesn't take much faith. He wants it persistent. He wants it there. But he's letting you know, hey, that's all you need. It's so tiny. So tiny amount of faith. Little, little, little. Now, in Matthew 13... 31 through 32. I'm going to ask you to open up to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. 31 through 32. <clears throat> Another parable he put forth to them, saying, and in my Bible it's the red words of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Boom, this little tiny thing. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. See, we miss the big, big picture that now the mustard seed is the smallest. Actually, the smallest is an orchid seed. I also did my research on that. However, why didn't he use an orchid seed? Well, an orchid turns into an orchid. And it's a fragile flower, isn't it? People that have handled orchids or grow orchids, we knew one, <clears throat> right? They were fragile, they're fragile flowers. He, do you notice how Jesus didn't use an example of a seed that produces a fragile, beautiful flower? Amen. He used the seed that produces a mighty tree. Amen. They also grow very well in Iran, where they originated, in case you want to know. Okay. Sorry, those are just little tiny bits of information for you. Okay. So, the mustard seed is small but it, re it reaps a large harvest. And when Jesus was using this as an example, he was actually talking about world evangelism because he was like a broken small example. That it, they didn't expect him to look and be who he was. He was just the carpenter's son, right? But it was the seed that was planted. His death and his resurrection was the seed that was planted for world evangelism, for a world harvest. This is our mandate. Our mandate is to win the lost, to build the kingdom of heaven, to build our God's kingdom of heaven. I want to populate heaven with as many people as I can. And then if I can't populate heaven with that many people, because I'm only one small woman in Niagara Falls, but I'm mighty, then I'm going to sow into ministries of evangelism where they reap bountiful harvests. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Don't get discouraged. And you know what, Niagara Falls, we may be small, but we're mighty. And we've had a lot of souls saved in this church. A lot. And it's really important to the Father. That's what's important to him. We can't keep our eyes off of what's important to our Father. 
you know, the kingdom of heaven, he knew would be, it will be, and it is significant. Significant to him. The mustard seed has destined greatness. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But we only need faith that tiny. You know, there are times where you're praying for something. You, you have something heavy on your heart. You're praying for a loved one. You're praying for someone who's sick. You're praying for something that you don't think will ever come. And this is the size of the faith. Come on, y'all. Can you do this? You got this. You got this. It's tiny. You can do it. You can do this. You can have faith this size. You can do it. It's not too hard. It's not too hard for you. Do you see how easy he made it for us? What a loving, loving father. He made it that simple. He made it that simple. Now in Mark 431, it says, it is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But in verse 32, it says, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches, large branches, so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. <coughs> Did you notice how the Gospels will always play off of each other? If you hear one thing in one Gospel, you'll find it in another Gospel because they all walked with Jesus, okay? And then there was the Apostle Paul who did not walk with Jesus. He was really persecuting the early church. But his faith was, you know, I, I want to share this with you, and this isn't in my notes, but sometimes, you know, sometimes people, when they get saved, it's a radical salvation. I call them radical salvations because they're kind of more like Saul of Tarsus. Saul was Paul. And God had to literally knock Saul off his horse. I always wondered if that's where, you know, you get knocked off your high horse came from, that saying, possibly. God knocked Saul off of his horse and blinded him for three days. He was persecuting the early church, which was Jewish, by the way. And, you know, Peter, the apostle Peter, his mandate was the Jews. That's who he ministered to. He was winning over multitudes of Jewish people. The apostle Paul, Saul, became Paul. And his mandate was to win over the Gentiles. The Gentiles were anyone who wasn't Jewish. How many of you are grateful today that we were grafted in? Amen. We were grafted in and we're promised the same promise as the Jews. Do you understand that? See, there's so much, there's so much behind this mustard seed. There's so much behind it. And God just, he just wants you to know that sometimes we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. And people that live in this state, we're praying for freedoms and we're praying for our rights and we're praying for a breakthrough and we're praying for promises and we're praying for this and we're praying for that and we're praying for this and we're praying for that. And we start losing momentum because we start not seeing breakthroughs right away, right? But God doesn't, he wants us to be persistent. He wants us to be tenacious with us, right? But he says, you just have to have the size of the little tiny mustard seed. How many of you want to move mountains in this state? How many of you want to move mountains in your family? Come on. We got some mountains going on. It's time for us to move the mountains. You know, the Psalms today were so prophetic. <laughs> so prophetic it's time to move you know there's a part of that song that says we don't have to wait on the move of God we are the move of God you are the move of God I am the move of God we are the move of God and the father is saying all you have to have is that faith that size of that mustard seed 
and you could do it. And he said, mustard seed. <laughs> so there you go. It's a mustard seed, everybody. Mustard seed. Okay. Anywho. 11, Hebrews 11.6. 11, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Uh-oh. So here comes another thing. We see in Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who? God. It's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. You got to believe that he is who he says he is. And he can do what he says he can do. And he already did what he said he did. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He'll reward you. You got to believe it. You got to have faith. Because if you don't have faith, it's impossible to please him. Well, how much faith do I have to have, Lord? This tiny amount. That's it. That's it. Can you please him? Can you please him today? Yeah, you can. I love this little tiny mustard seed. I'm going to be staring at this thing all day. I love it. I love it. You know, sometimes I like the visuals because it helps you remember. It helps you put something before you. It helps you see better, right? I'm still waiting for the day. The Lord has been showing me a vision of something I want to do, but I got to find my props to do it. And all I'm going to say is it's about kicking the devil in the head. And I'm going to do it. I got a little weight to lose and I got to get in some shape. Because I got to be able to do a sidekick. But when I do it, I'm going to Kung Fu Panda. The enemy. Okay? All right. My poor husband is like, dear God, just put your glasses on and get back to the puppet. I'm almost done. So you can't please God without faith. But you only need the mustard seed size. I'm going to keep saying that to you. That's all you need to move the mountains in your life. How many of you have mountains in your life? Everybody is raising their hands because we all have mountains in our lives. And all we need is that faith, that tiny, tiny bit of faith to move that mountain. Well, you know what Jesus tells us that you got to speak to it. You got to speak to the mountain with your little mustard seed size of faith. Can you do that? You know, I believe too, he used something so small because you know, when you first come to the Lord, you're a babe in the Lord, right? There's some Christian names for you. And you have to be bottle fed. But did you ever see the babies pray sometimes? They're, they get it. They read it and they're like, yeah. And they're, bow, 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 bow. He didn't make us have to do a lot. All right, go to Galatians 2.20, and this is my last scripture. Galatians 2.20, and I'm going to read 2.20, and then, of course, I'm going to go back up because that's how I roll, and I like to do things that way. So Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which now I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to go back up to 17. You know, you live by faith. Your salvation is by faith. You know, some people, they, they received the Lord and they said, I said the sinner's prayer, but I don't know if anything happened. Well, you know, a lightning bolt is not going to come down and strike you from heaven unless you have a solid Tarsus experience. Then you're going to get knocked off your horse and be blinded for three days. Okay? Some people get saved that way. But for the most part, people will say a little prayer. They confess that they're a sinner. They receive the Lord. And they, they're waiting for something. Well, it's by faith. It's by faith. You believe by faith that you're saved. Okay, and then the, later on in scripture, it tells us in other parts of scripture that the Holy Spirit will bear witness with you that you're a child of God. Now, if we go to 17, though, 
Galatians 2, 17, it says, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? What does it say there? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroy, meaning the sin nature in you, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified, now again in, in 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. He gave himself for you. Point to yourself. Are you a you? Yeah. yeah. He gave himself for you. And you've been crucified in him. Your flesh nature has been crucified. So you know what that means? You leave it at the foot of the cross. That's your sin nature. Don't keep picking it up. Brethren, don't keep picking it up. Nail that thing to the cross. Because it's been crucified. Amen? And all you need is that little bit of faith. I want you to go out this week and know that it doesn't take much. It doesn't take a lot of faith to move the mountains in your life. I don't know what you guys have. I don't know what you have before you. Maybe some of you have some really big things, some really big trials, some big things coming up. And the Lord is saying to you today, it doesn't take a lot. And he's there with you. He's in you. He's the hope of glory. He abides in you. You don't go alone. You go with him. Amen? <clears throat> now, Father, we just lift up all the people that are listening. And I ask, if you've never received the Lord as your personal Savior, that you would bow your heads and bow your hearts. Because, you know, we have to bow our heart. It's this heart that causes so much problems for us. And this thing, the mind. The mind and the heart. And so bow your heart before him. And all you have to say, and you guys can repeat it after me if you want to, Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I have a flesh nature. But I repent of my sin. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, amen. And that's all it takes. It was that little mustard seed of faith. That was a good amen. That's all it is. Now, by faith, receive it. You know, sometimes I do gestures because I am Italian and I like to talk with my hands. You know what I mean? Sometimes you got to do this. I receive it. Pull it down. Come on. Reach up and pull it down. I receive it by faith in Jesus' mighty name. Now, Christians, soldiers, go out and march for Jesus. Because there's a world out there that's dead and they're dying, and they're broken, and they have no hope. Let's be the light, let's be the hope, and go out and tell them that Jesus lives. Amen? Amen. So that they can have it too. Don't be a Jesus hawk. All right? All right.